Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivers. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. And what I love about my channel is they are very smart, very uh, um, knowledgeable biohackers who may or may not even be in the medical field, but people who have a particular personal interest in the metabolic space. And occasionally I get emails and normally I'll respond briefly with one or two lines, but sometimes those emails make me think. And I got an email just a little bit ago from a gentleman by the name of Daryl Merriman, who describes himself as a subscriber. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl, for that. But he writes to me and he says, Dear Dr. Robert Sivers, thank you for your YouTube videos. I've enjoyed your explanation of the physiology and biology of the relevant pathways in the body. This type of in-depth information is hard to come by online. Since you seem to be very knowledgeable, and I'm going to argue with him about this, I'm not knowledgeable about, but I I have to understand our evolutionary past as it relates to um, the way the body responds right now. But he says, since you seem to be very knowledgeable about our evolutionary past, I was wondering if you had an opinion or thoughts about why selected cells of the body require or prefer glucose over fatty acids. It's confusing to me that while carbohydrate consumption is not essential, it is essential for the body to convert other substrates to a form of carbohydrate. And we're going to expand this. Very cool question. And really what it comes down to evolutionarily is sustainability of supply. So if you were dependent on the consumption of carbohydrates, and we are not, the human body is not, so I'll expand this beyond carbohydrates. When it comes to energy, we can get energy from Carbohydrates, primarily glucose, fructose, galactose, from amino acids, and from lipids, from fat. Those are the three sources of energy. And none of them have to be consumed. And without them, we will not survive from an energy perspective. Amino acids and certain two essential fatty acids are essential from a structural perspective. So the first response, Daryl, is that no energy substrate is essential because they can all be interconverted. Protein, are, you can convert certain things to protein. Yes, you can create protein, the non-essential proteins. You can create fat, obviously, just look at me. And you can create sugar from those other substrates, at least from the glycerol component. So the next thing is that the human body uses two energy sources. It can use ketones and fatty acids, which I lump into one, the fat processing, and then it can use glucose as a substrate. There are a few others, lactate, which gets produced internally, few, and a certain amino acid, certain cells, for example, the gut cells only use glycine. I'm going to ignore those cells. So glucose obligate cells are not that common in the liver, as not, not that common in the body. What's interesting is the obvious one are red blood cells. But the reason why red blood cells can only use sugar they can't use fat and ketones, is because they have no nucleus. Red blood cells lose their nucleus when they mature, and they can only use sugar. So they carry oxygen around the body. They can only use sugar because they don't have the equipment inside of the cell to process fat. The one that most people don't know about is the liver. The liver cannot, the hepatocytes, cannot use ketones as a source of energy. They produce ketones, but the liver itself is a glucose obligate. It can only use glucose. But the liver itself doesn't store ketones. It doesn't store fat. The human liver, shark liver does. The human liver does not store fat. The human liver stores glucose as glycogen. And the ability to make glycogen is a priority of the liver. So it'll always have access to its own sugar. What about fatty liver? Yeah, the liver produces ketones. The liver will convert excess sugar once its glycogen stores are full. It'll convert that to fat, triglycerides. And if that process, the removal of that fat to the fat cells versus the production, if the production is greater than the removal, you develop fat in the liver. But that fat is harmful to the liver. It isn't, the liver is not storing the fat. 
The liver is just pissed off and frustrated <laughs> that it can't ship it out quick enough in a molecule called VLDL. So it's a mismatch of transport out versus production. And the liver is desperately trying to protect you from excess sugar, which in our evolution we have never, ever seen except for short bursts, usually in the fall, or when we come across a honey nest, a bee's nest with a ton of honeycomb in it. So you can, evolutionarily, we could pig out on honey. We could eat some fruit for a brief period of time. We could actually create physiologic insulin resistance for a short period of time to store that sugar as fat to help us to get through the lean winters. But the, the glucose obligate cells are very, very few. The majority of cells prefer ketones and non-esterified fatty acids. For example, the heart, the busiest organ in most people's bodies, because most people don't think, so their brain, the brain's actually the most, the busiest organ. Some people have one, other people don't. Some people don't have a heart. Now I'm being silly now. The heart, if you think about it, is the most continuously active organ in the body. It's got a baseline, doc, doc, and then if you're running, if you're excited, if adrenaline's there, you can speed up the heart tremendously. You can double or triple your heart rate if you're low. If I can see a heart rate, I typically am in the 50s, I can get my heart rate up to 150, 160, triple. Think about that. Babies have a very high heart rate relative to adults. So, and that's, that's a talk for another day. But the heart, if you break it down, beautiful paper written a little while ago, um, I think 19, I can't remember. I, I can put the quotes in the show notes. However, about 85% of the energy that the heart uses are non-esterified fatty acids. Now, the heart's a muscle, it's smooth muscle. So non-esterified fatty acids. The rest, the remaining 10 or 15%, is mostly made up of two variables. Ketones, ideally, or glucose. And the variation of that is based on supply, not demand. We'll come back to that in a little bit. So the, the heart makes a demand for energy, but the supply is controlled by the liver and by hormones that affect the liver. We'll get to that in a second. This is important to understand. And then a tiny fraction, 1% to 2% at most, of cardiac energy is lactate and amino acids, creatine. So the heart can use several different energy sources, but the dominant energy source that almost all cells, except for the pure glucose obligates, use is non-esterified fatty acids. With ketones and glucose only supplying a tiny fraction. And the supply of non-esterified fatty acids in disease states, and the commonest disease is insulin resistance, the release of fat from the fat cells is dramatically affected and blocked by insulin. So when you reduce your non-esterified fatty acid utilization, obviously ketosis is going to be blocked in the liver. So you're going to have to be using a much higher percentage of sugar. And that elevated level of sugar damages the blood supply to those organs and damages the organ tissue itself. So the pathologic state is when you get a reduction, let's say in the heart, below 85% of non-esterified fatty acids because of hyperinsulinemia. And that affects so many different functions because the circulation system is what drives supply around the body and removal around the body. Same thing with the brain. The brain is primarily adapted evolutionarily to use ketones. But when brain function speeds up, you want something to add to that because the supply of ketones is relatively non-fluctuating, relatively non-variable. But you can have massive surges of sugar. And that's all created by the liver. So the baseline for cells that can use both are ketones because there is a constant supply of ketones as long as your insulin level is low. And then during and after a meal, and we eat way too often as human beings, but when you do eat, you flip over usually to produce a little bit of, of sugar under the influence of insulin that's entering the brain. But the constant is ketones, which are relatively non-fluctuating. Whereas glucose, you can create huge fluctuations, not just with what you're eating, but with what the liver releases and the release hormone for surges of glucose from within the body is what? Quickly, adrenaline. Adrenaline is the overriding hormone 
that overrides the release of sugar, overrides insulin, overrides glucagon, that releases sugar into the bloodstream when you need it. It's the fright and flight thing. And that's sugar. Other than that, healthy human beings are in a state of glucagon dominance, which releases a little bit of trickle of sugar, but primarily releases ketones on demand from the cells. And that is the adaptation. We've just shifted that massively across to instead of our bodies being in energy demand and the supply coming from the liver, most of us live now in the last 50 to 100 years in a state of oversupply and the body has become dysfunctional because it's having to deal with this chronic tsunami of incoming energy from our gut rather than having episodic brief periods of supply at lowish levels and then having to, to generate supply from the liver, not from the gut. So instead of the liver, for most of us, being a net controller and supplier of energy to the body, with the gut just slowly augmenting some of that, the liver is now to take on a whole defensive role to defend against the tsunami of food entering the gut. And the gut has become the supply organ rather than the liver constantly snacking, binge eating. So, Daryl, that is what's changed. Our oversupply of sugar and our oversupply of continuous energy from the gut rather than from the liver. The liver should be regulating energy supply most of the time other than when you do eat a meal. So I hope that helps a little bit. But it's affected so many different systems. You know... If you think about it, what was in massive supply and demand, guess what? I'm going to stop there. I'm going to talk about this in the next video. But I hope that that helps a little bit.